Um, so, <laughs> um, welcome everyone uh, in the room and online. Um, so, as Steve said, I'm going to be talking about teacher-child interaction training. Um, before I jump in, Steve was just giving some credit to all the pay it forward that happens in this community, and I want to recognize that a lot of the content uh, in this presentation is taken from many PCIT master trainers all over the country, um, and I have just been grandfathered in to this awesome training. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. Uh, this presentation, there's so many things that I could say about TCIT. Uh, my goal today is going to be to help educators um, and teachers and professionals get a good understanding of what TC TCIT is and how to best manage um, student and classroom behavior. So I can't talk about TCIT <clears throat> without talking about parent-child interaction therapy, which we call PCIT. You're going to hear a lot of acronyms today. Get ready. Um, but PCIT is a dyadic uh, behavioral intervention for children ages usually around two to seven. Um, it's for parents uh, or caregivers that want to focus on decreasing externalizing child behavior. So aggression, defiance, um, increasing social skills and cooperation, and improving the parent-child attachment relationship. While PCAT was initially developed for children with disruptive behavior disorders, um, it has been adapted for several populations, including kids with internalizing disorders. So, since it was originally adapted for kids with DVDs, and um, TCIT also focuses on kids often with disruptive behavior disorders, I just want to give you some facts about what is out in the research. So, um, DVDs affect as many as 16% of children and include significant impairment in social and academic functioning. Um, DVDs are often thought to include oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. 10% of the children who need treatment for, OD, for ODD and CD actually receive services, which leaves a lot of children with these disorders not receiving the support they need at home or in the classrooms. And when kids go without good treatment, there's an increased risk of long-term academic problems and failure in school. Um, if left untreated, these children are at increased risk for school dropout, involvement in the juvenile justice system, and drug use, depression, and sometimes violent behavior. So PCIT was developed to help parents and caregivers support their kids with disruptive behavior disorders. It was developed by Sheila Eiberg in the 1970s. Um, and it helps parents learn effective behavior management strategies while improving their relationship with their children. It's a two-phase treatment. So the first phase is called child-directed interactions, and the second phase is called parent-directed interactions. So I'm going to call those CDI and PDI, for those of you who aren't familiar with PCIT. So in CDI, the goal is to build warmth in the parent-child or caregiver-child relationship. Um, it's to teach the parent effective behavior man management strategies with using positive attending skills. Once the parent has mastered this phase, then we move to PDI, which is called parent-directed, which is basically how I think like if the child was in the driver's seat in CDI, now the parent's in the driver's seat. And we're teaching them to use effective limit setting um, and consistent discipline strategies. It's a performance-based treatment, which means that it's based on parent acquisition of skills. And TCIT, when implemented, is often also a performance-based treatment. So just to give you a little snapshot, for those of you who aren't as familiar, this is PCIT in action in a clinic. So um, you can see there would be the parent and the child who's a teddy bear in this picture. Um, and that's a two-way mirror. And this would be in PDI because there you see there's a time, the timeout chair is put out and there's a timeout room. And the parent has a little bug in the ear so that the coach who is behind the mirror is able to coach the parent or the caregiver through situations where they're practicing this limit setting and practicing the skills. And you can see in this picture too, um, it might identify a spouse who's not there. So what's great is that when both caregivers are involved, the spouse is able to give feedback behind the mirror, um, is able to observe their partner using the skills. So this is just a little snapshot showing that PC
CIT and research has found to have astronomical effect sizes and uh, is a replicated uh, evidence-based treatment. PCIT has uh, a lot of positive outcomes. Um, some of the big highlights are that um, it reduces disruptive behaviors and increases compliance in kids. And um, parents learn to increase positive verbalizations and decrease their critical statements. So now that you've learned all about PCIT and how it helps parents, um, there is some research that shows uh, if the gains from PCIT for children generalize to classroom settings. Um, some of the research supports that when children's uh, compliance increases at home, that they see that generalized to the school setting. But teachers often also need these tools to help manage these kids and manage their classrooms. Uh, teachers report high rates of disruptive behavior in their classrooms, which leads to diminished time devoted to learning and for kids uh, gaining academic skills. Um, a lot of teachers report feeling dissatisfied with the behavior management training they've had and unprepared to manage children with disruptive behavior. And if you're a teacher out there listening, um, a lot of times professional development comes in the form of a didactic training or a half-day workshop where you might be taught incredible, wonderful, evidence-based skills, but then you go back into your classroom where somebody's sharpening a pencil, another person's screaming, um, you know, somebody's on the floor crying, and the other kid's not taking out their homework, and it's really hard to implement these strategies in that moment. Um, which I'm going to get to and why we love TCIT so much. So in the classrooms, disruptive behavior affects teacher stress and confidence. And what happens is, is these interactional patterns that get reinforced at home often also get reinforced in classrooms. So when kids um, get reinforced for noncompliance at home, sometimes in classrooms this happens with teachers as well. So that is why PCIT was adapted um, by all the wonderful PCIT master trainers and trainers out in the field um, to be used in the classroom. So that's what we're going to talk about today is teacher-child interaction therapy. And I do want to highlight before I jump in that TCIT has a lot of adaptations and a lot of variations of um, how it's implemented. So like Dr. Kurtz was saying, um, we've implemented in different schools in New York City, and I'm going to be talking maybe about one way that it might be implemented. So uh, this is a slide that I borrowed, and um, <laughs> basically we love PCIT and TCIT. I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, it is so incredibly effective, and um, so we just want to highlight how excited we are about this. Um, okay, so adapting PCIT to the classroom. So it still adheres to the core principles of PCIT, which um, I'm going to get into when I talk more about TCIT. Um, it attends to the unique dynamics of the classroom, though, so not looking at just the dyadic relationship, but the teacher in relation to a classroom of students. There's emphasis on the pride skills, which I haven't talked about yet, but I will teach you about in a little bit, and consistent discipline strategies. Over the course of a semester or a cohort of training teachers, it's going to include teach sessions, just like in PCIT. Um, there's going to be coaching ses sessions of live interactions in the classroom, um, direct observation of skills, practicing outside of those coaching sessions, and um, standard measures of behavior change. So it's, a, it's an assessment-driven intervention, um, and it shares all these characteristics with PCIT. So what's the challenge? As what, what I was kind of um, referring to earlier is that teachers often get professional development, and they get good training. And part of PCIT um, is, and TCIT is that didactic training. But then why we think it's the greatest thing is that it includes what we call like that special sauce, which is the live coaching. So teachers learn the skills in didactic sessions, but then they get me or a trainer or any TCI tra TCIT trainer in the classroom, and I'm going to show you right here like a little example. So there's a teacher has this in their ear and maybe the trainer standing outside of the classroom in the back of the classroom sometimes live coaching right over the shoulder and is actually helping them to implement it in the in the moment. And without this live coaching, often what happens is it's really hard to implement skills consistently. 
So um, as Dr. Kurtz and I were talking about this, uh, this was, uh, he thought, uh, you know, live coaching um, is hard. TCIT is a big investment and it's often hard to get teachers to buy in. They have to have time outside of their classroom to be part of these training sessions. They have to allow a new person, an adult, into their classroom um, to be in their ear while they're trying to teach a social studies lesson about the boroughs of New York City, and I'm praising them for labeled praising and um, for <laughs> getting a child to sit in their seat, and it's not easy. Um, but what we do see is that it has really um, significant and sustainable effects. And so just like anything that you want to do, if you want to be good at it, if you want to be great at it, um, uh, and if you want it to last for a long time, you have to put in a lot of work. So just like Michael Phelps and all his gold medals, we want our teachers to be like the Olympians of behavior change. Uh, so taking a step back and kind of looking at conceptually what is TCIT targeting? What kind of um, these, the negative behavioral interactions that I talked about? Um, so let's look through this coercive cycle. A teacher makes a request. So maybe the teacher says, um, please sit down because the child is wandering around the classroom. Um, and the child refuses or ignores. So maybe they just continue wandering around, looking at a book, um, maybe they say no. Um, the teacher starts to get irritated and maybe requests again several times, maybe starts to yell at some point because they're overwhelmed in trying to manage a class. And that um, circular yelling and escalation of disruptive behavior tends to, to increase. Um, so eventually what happens is the teacher either gives up or succeeds by yelling. Um, and what happens then? So if the teacher gives up, um, then the child's disruptive behavior is reinforced because what the child learns is if I ignore, if I refuse, if I like, you know, do whatever the child was doing to try and avoid sitting down, then my teacher will eventually back off. And the teacher's giving up is negatively reinforced often by the end of a tantrum. So kids often in class their tantrums when their teacher's trying to request them to do something they don't want to, and when the teacher stops, the tantrum stops. Now, if the teacher succeeds by yelling, then the escalation of the teacher is, is reinforced. And now a teacher learns, in order to get my kids to do what I need them to do, I have to yell, and the kids learn to listen when the teacher's yelling. Um, and this gets negatively reinforced over time. And when I go into schools to train teachers and I ask them, what do you feel like you need help with? Almost a huge majority of the time, it's, um, I feel like I just get really angry. I just feel like I'm angry all the time, and I want to change that. And so this um, this intervention really targets targets that. So with that in mind, um, now looking at an overview of TCIT. So it's unlike PCIT is a two-phase treatment. The way that we implement TCIT is in three phases. Um, so first is CDI, where the goal is to learn to attend to positive behaviors, avoid criticism rapid fire questions and commands. And with each of these phases, I'm just gonna tell them to you and then we're gonna jump in and learn more about them. Um, then after the teachers have mastered or become competent in the CDI skills, um, then they learn how to use the CDI skills for prevention and shaping. Uh, and CDI skills and pride skills are uh, interchangeable in a way and I'm gonna teach you about them in a second. Um, and then after they've learned to use those skills to shape and evoke certain behaviors, um, they learn the teacher-directed skills. So in PCIT, it's parent-directed. Now it's the TDI skills, where they learn to deliver effective and consistent discipline strategies. Uh, so the goals of TCIT are to increase students' psychosocial functioning, um, to have more positive teacher-student relationships, and this is so powerful because when you train teachers um, in this strategy, in this intervention, you see over time how their entire classroom can change if it's done consistently. Um, kids seek positive attention and they love and they're looking for praise. Um, so it also helps teachers with all kinds of effective classroom management strategies, disruptive behaviors decrease and child compliance increases. Okay, so we're gonna break down into the phases. So phase one, CDI, child-directed interactions. So CDI and TCIT, teachers learn to use the pride skills, those are kind of like the do skills, and they learn to avoid the don'ts. So just 
just like in PCIT, it's unnecessary questions, unnecessary commands, and critical statements. Now, the little difference is in, in PCIT, we say no questions at all, no commands, and no critical statements. We're pretty hard fast about that. With teachers, if you're doing push and coaching um, or coding, teachers have to ask academic questions. What's two plus two um, for? So we differentiate between behavior related questions such as, what are you supposed to be doing right now? Or are you ready? That's an unnecessary question versus an academic related. And they do their very best to avoid commands. So then if they're not doing any of those things, which often if you walk into a room, your first meeting teachers building rapport and you tell them, okay, the first thing I want you to do is ask no questions and no commands. They look at you like you're crazy um, because <laughs> this is the way that teachers interact with their students often. Um, so we have to give them skills to use and these are the pride skills. Uh, so just, I know that I have a room here full of PCIT uh, trainers with me in person. So I'm gonna ask them to give me examples of these skills and I will repeat it back to you. So uh, somebody give me an example of a labeled praise. Great job sitting in your seat. Great job sitting in your seat. It's positive and it's specific. Okay, what is a reflection? You want us to give you a reflection. So Dr. Abney just repeated back to me exactly what I said. That's a reflection. It's repeating. It's telling the child, I heard you. You're validated. Um, and it will often allows the child to then move on um, from what they were trying to communicate. Imitation is just um, kind of modeling what the child is doing, getting down on their level. If they're working on something, maybe getting down to the desk with them. Um, it's a, more of a qualitative skill. Um, Chelsea, what's a behavior description? You're presenting on PCIT. Great. Chelsea just told me exactly what I'm doing in this moment, something that can be observed. Um, and then E is enjoy. So we're helping, we're reminding the teachers to keep a positive and warm attitude. So CDI coaching in the classroom. Here's a little snapshot of what it might look like. So here, this coach is, this trainer is doing live coaching. So she's sitting over the shoulder of the teacher. The teacher is using the skills of the student, and the coach is giving live feedback. So great labeled praise, nice job describing what he's doing, um, and labeling those skills and reinforcing for the teacher in that moment. Okay, so teachers learn the pride skills. Then they might ask, well, if I can't give a command, um, what do I do if I'm using these skills but they're not listening? Um, or they're disrupting the class. So that's a reteach active ignoring, which many professionals logged in are probably familiar with this concept, but I'll go through it quickly. Um, so negative attention can be just as reinforcing as positive attention. And active ignoring is the, is the practice of giving no attention. So that means no eye contact, um, no verbal attention, turning your body away, physical touch, all of that. Um, and often, so this can be different with a parent and a child versus with a teacher with an entire class where a te teacher's teaching a lesson and one kid is maybe singing out loud or banging on the desk in front of them. It can be disruptive. So you actually discuss with the teachers how they're going to explain this to the class and how they're going to work with the class. So sometimes teachers have a nonverbal signal, like uh, when they want the whole class to active ignore, maybe they'll do this or this. Um, sometimes teachers will be more transparent and actually praise kids for uh, ignoring other kids. So great job focusing on your work and our, our great job, um, you know, not paying attention to um, Sammy, which not paying attention is a little negative. I can hear myself. We want praises to be positive. Um, but we but we might actually praise kids for just ignoring. Good job ignoring that and focusing on your work. So yeah. Oh, so Dr. Avney said, good job looking away. That's a positive way to praise ignoring. So that always, and we're going to talk about positive opposites in a minute. So get ready. Um, but can't ignoring make it worse? And of course, the answer is yes. Um, and we have to anticipate an extinction burst. So any new response to a child's existing behavior may initially increase that behavior. So think about a broken 
Coke and soda machine. So imagine like it's a hot day, you want a soda, you're looking forward to it, you go, you put your dollar in the soda. Usually when you put your dollar in the soda machine, you get a soda. So um, you're like, what's going on? So maybe you try and press the button to get your coins back or your dollar back, nothing happens. Then maybe you start pressing the soda button again and again, maybe you're hitting it. Maybe if you really wanted that soda, you might kick the machine, you might even yell something out loud. So this is what's happening when a teacher first starts active ignoring. Because usually Zoe in the back of the class, whenever she yells out, um, the teacher turns around and says, Zoe, be quiet. And, the and she gets that attention from the teacher. But if the teacher ignores, Zoe might start banging on the desk, she might get out of her seat, she might start yelling. Um, and eventually her behavior is going to go down if the ignoring is consistent. And of course, ignoring must be used with a label praise. So the moment that Zoe quiets down, the teacher distinctly turns her attention and says, great job using an indoor voice or great job listening or being quiet. So this is just a fun little picture of what active <laughs> ignoring can look like. And this kid did come back and clean up their mess um, and get praised for it. Um, and this is a real picture from, I think, Dr. Hertz uh, doing TCIT in a classroom. So um, this does sometimes happen, which is why teachers need your support. Okay, so now teachers have either mastered or become competent in the CDI skills, um, and then we teach them how to use these skills to prevent, shape, and evoke Could desired behaviors. Question. Yeah. Um, is the mastery criteria different for CDI, given that some questions and commands are acceptable? That's a good question. I am going to talk about competency and like mastery criteria in a little bit, so I'll make sure to come back to that. Okay. Um, oh, so prevent. So when we're teaching. Oh, and for those of you online who didn't hear, uh, Dr. Avni asked if the criteria, the mastery criteria in TCIT, is different than PCIT because we're a little more. We have different rules for academic versus behavioral related questions and etc. So I said I'm going to talk about that um, near the end. Okay. So in order to prevent and shape behavior, uh, we have to understand the basic dynamic of differential attention. So um, whatever we give attention to will increase and what are, whatever we do not give attention to will eventually decrease. So if you give um, positive attention, if you give attention to um, positive behavior, then you're saying keep doing that behavior, you're reinforcing it. If you give attention to negative behavior, you're falling into that criticism trap. If and this is an important one. If you give no attention to positive behavior, it's kind of like you're letting the sleeping dog lay. So what I tell teachers is that they really have to become like detectives um, for positive behavior in their classroom. Because um, when the, the kids become so attuned to their praise and their language and their skills that when they stop hearing that, that's often when um, disruptive behavior happens. And then um, when you give no attention to undesired behavior, that's active ignoring um, and selective attention. Okay, so the first thing we teach teachers is the, I, the concept of shaping. So let's say we want, I walk into class or a trainer walks into class and says, okay, what's your goal for Alex today? And the teacher says, I want him to sit in his seat. So we break that down into small steps and they use their pride skills to reinforce that. So if Alex is up walking around class, you're kind of, you're that detective. You're looking for the moment Alex maybe even looks at his desk. And then, oh, you're looking at your seat. Oh, you're walking to your seat. Good job walking to your desk. And you are sitting down. Thank you for sitting in your seat. That's really what it sounds like. Um, and you might think, oh my gosh, that is exhausting. Um, teachers are talking so much and paying such close attention to behavior. Wouldn't it just be easier to just say, Alex, sit in your seat? Um, maybe if your child was compliant, yes, but if not, you're going to end up in that negative course of cycle again, and you are kind of shaping your students to respond to your positive attention. And teachers report feeling like happier. They often will report into this training that they just feel happier, that they feel more positive, that they feel more calm because they don't have to go there to that negative uh, coercion cycle. Okay, so there's shaping and then there's prevention. So prevention is when we're asking what could go wrong in this situation with these students. Um, so if you're a trainer and you're walking in for a coaching session, you're going to have the teacher think ahead of time, what could go wrong today? So, well, um, 
one of my students has been really fixated on what they're doing after school today because they have a play date and they keep asking about it and interrupting. So then we think of what's the positive opposite. The positive opposite of that behavior would be staying on task or staying focused or keeping their brain on what they're working on. So I'm going to coach the teacher or the trainer would coach the teacher to start reinforcing the positive opposite with the pride skills before that behavior even happens. And the key to making this effective is three things. Um, that, the, that the pride skills are specific, very specific. So the more specific, the better. So they're staying on task, but then there's keeping your eyes on the smart board or picking up your pencil or working through. Um, the more specific you are with your praise and with your describing, the more likely you are to prevent. Um, and then providing it at a, at a high rate. So you're not even leaving room for that um, disruptive behavior to happen. And then also, this is important that the environment is sufficiently managed. So, so if teachers are like rock stars at these skills, but they have four kids sitting next to each other who they know are going to aggravate each other or laugh or giggle or, you know, that's other things that we help teachers with is managing the environment in a way to prevent those kinds of behaviors from happening. Okay. So we're gonna do a little game, and all my folks online, I want you to participate. Steve, Dr. Kurtz is gonna be moderating. Um, so I am going to put up a problem, behavior defiance, and I want you to type in um, what you think the positive opposite would be. And I'm gonna wait. I see people are typing. Okay, I'm seeing. <laughs> I just got a praise for my behavior description. Following rules, compliance, following directions, listening to what I ask. Beautiful. And I would change that to listening to what I told you to do. Um, but, yep, we're getting more. Acceptance. I love these. And following directions is what I put, which is what uh, Amy online with us also put. But all of your answers are correct. So we'll do a few more just for fun. Okay. Problem behavior is hitting. What positive opposite uh, would you reinforce? Hands to self, safe hands, gentle hands. Good job keeping your hands calm. That's a labeled praise. Beautiful. So being safe with your hands. You guys got this. We'll, we'll breeze through these next two. Uh, problem behavior calling out. Very, very common all the time happening. Waiting to be called on. I love that. That's very specific. Raising your hand. Nice. Waiting your turn. Great. These are all specific things that we coach teachers to praise. Good job waiting your turn. Raising hand with a quiet mouth. Love it. So I put raising hand, but those are all also great answers. Okay. We'll do one more. Screaming. I love the participation. Uh, using an inside voice, using a quiet voice, Ex exactly. <laughs> Steve, Dr. Kurtz is commenting, there's a ringer in the crowd, someone we did TCIT with. <laughs> using an indoor voice, beautiful. So, um, and while you all who are participating are pros, it can be sometimes hard for teachers to find the positive opposite in the moment. So the more you practice, the more natural it becomes with them. Okay, so the last step of shaping and prevention is evoking desired behaviors. So um, that's when you want to get the child to do something without giving a command. Um, so the first step is giving a hint, and I love this step. It's, um, it can be so powerful. And it's just a neutral statement about what's going on that's a hint for the child. So let's say um, everybody's getting their folder out and putting it on their desk to start working, but um, Dylan hasn't gotten his folder out yet and he's staring at the ceiling. So the teacher walks up to Dylan, makes eye contact, and just says, everyone's getting their folder out from their desk. It's a hint. It's a neutral statement. It's letting him know what's going on right now. Often, this is enough to get Dylan to take his folder out of his desk. So then he reaches into his desk. The teacher starts reinforcing. I see you're reaching in your desk to get your folder. Great job taking it out and putting it on your desk. Now, if the child is engaging in more truly, uh, the function of the behavior is more oppositional, this hint might not work. So then we take out more of the big guns, which are the when then, if then statements. Um, so that might sound like when you get your folder from your desk, then you can choose what color markers you want to use. And 
knowing that choosing those color markers is something that's more reinforcing than being oppositional or not or getting that negative attention. Um, so the biggest challenge here is helping teachers find consequences that are that are more reinforcing or consequences that are um, punishing enough to get the child to um, follow through. Okay, so that's phase two. And then we move into phase three, which is the teacher-directed interactions. And I will have time for questions at the end, so I know I'm talking through everything quickly, but we'll make time. Um, so phase three, um, so TDI and TCIT. Um, TDI teachers learn to use commands, but now only when necessary. And what I love so much is that once I get teachers to this phase, they often just can't give commands anymore. I try mm -hmm. and get them to use commands when I'm coaching them and they won't do it because those CDI skills are powerful and they've learned that they can get their kids to do what they want or what they need without needing to give commands. But there are situations when you have to give commands and give effective commands, providing opportunities for children to comply, and then having positive and negative consequences, consistent consequences um, in mind. And in PCIT, we use the timeout chair as a consequence. Um, often in schools and in TCIT, we label it the try again chair. And especially in, especially in special ed settings, um, teachers tend to like this term more, where kids' behavior, the function of kids' behavior might not always be oppositional, but a lack of skills, um, processing disabilities, and other things where they don't want it to sound like timeout, but an opportunity to try again and come back. So um, there's a couple illustrations like this, which we can thank Bonnie Kurtz, Dr. <laughs> Kurtz's wonderful wife for. She did this for us. So just to like highlight the try again chair and the timeout chair, they're different, but they're serving the same function for the teacher. Okay, so the first thing is learning an effective command. Same thing as PCIT. You're gonna tell, you're not gonna ask. So um, please sit down versus could you sit down or can you? Um, we're being direct and we're, um, yep, we're, we're not asking will you, could you, let's. These are all indirect. Um, saying what to do, not what to stop doing. So this is where the positive opposites come in again. So instead of um, stop yelling, please use an inside voice. Single, not serial. So what happens sometimes, kids are finishing up their work and the teacher says, okay, when you finish your worksheet, put it in the finished folder of your binder, put your binder back on the shelf, then get your water bottle and line up to go to recess. So maybe like, let's say I'm in a class with eight kids because, um, or yeah, eight kids, maybe like one or two out of those eight are going to actually follow through with all those steps. Especially kids with executive functioning are going to get lost at the point of putting their paper away. And then the teacher is going to have to repeat herself or himself. Being specific and not vague. So as specific as possible always. So not behave, but um, please sit down or please pick up your pencil. Age appropriate. Um, being polite and neutral is another important one. So just with that coercive cycle, we don't want to teach kids to listen when we're yelling. Um, we want them to listen um, regardless. And so I like to think, some people have said using your recipe voice. I like to say, imagine you were giving somebody directions in a passenger seat. You're not going to yell at the person who's driving you somewhere. So think about in what kind of voice you would give somebody directions. Um, and if you need an explanation, giving it before the command. So um, it's time for recess, so please put your folder away. Not please put your folder away because it's time for recess. When you give the explanation after, you might invite some conversation or like, I don't want to go to recess. Um, and also you're matching the command and the compliance together in the shortest amount of time. Okay, and then used only when necessary. So um, now Dr. Kurtz said in the beginning, there's this little hand at the top, like an icon that looks like this. So I'm going to ask a question. Um, is this an effective command? And I want you to go up to that icon and either click ex that you agree or you don't agree. And we're going to get your votes. It looks like everybody's voting. But I 
can't see what the votes are. So, Steve, I'm going to need your help. I'm guessing that everybody got it. It's not too tricky. Everyone said disagree. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, I saw it right there. So, it's, so that's indirect and it's vague. Um, so, we would say, Dylan, please keep your hands to yourself. Steve's saying there's a lottery at the end for people who participate. That's a tangible reinforcement. We'll talk about that later. Uh, yes, that's direct and specific. <laughs> okay. So now teachers have learned all these skills over the course of your training semester or year. And they, a lot of times, will ask, when do I use what? Like, the biggest thing for them often is when do I use a command? I really don't know when. Um, and so this is a really nice graph that shows the progression of TCIT as it becomes more directive. Um, so CDI is used at baseline. And then um, prevention strategies and shaping strategies are used as you start to see a little bit of agitation or um, undesired behavior present. And then we use TDI, we teach them to use commands in more crisis type situ situations where the CDI skills have hit their limit. So a good example um, is in a class that's just happened with a teacher, a little girl who's quite uh, dysregulated at times uh, was on the floor lying on her back screaming um, and the teacher who was so well intentioned and well trained was trying to use her CDI skills to get this child to quietly return to her seat. She was beyond the point of that. Um, and the TAs in the class got frustrated. The class was getting disturbed and uh, and distracted. Um, so this would be a time to use a command. Um, this is a time where you need to say Sammy, please go back to your seat. Uh, and then if you don't go back to your seat, you'll have to go to the try again chair. And that's removing the child from that space so they have a chance to calm down. The try again chair is in, in the classroom. So uh, Dr. Avni just asked if the try again chair is in the classroom. Um, it can be. Sometimes it's outside the classroom, like right outside the door. <clears throat> it depends. Most teachers I've worked with like to have it right outside the door. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about like that setup um, and kind of some things that come up around that. So another illustration from Bonnie Kerr, your toolbox, your TCIT toolbox. Uh, okay, so right, right on. So potential barriers in TDI. So the timeout versus try again chair. So for example, um, a lot of times like in maybe a special ed setting or a setting, kids are uh, given the opportunity to take breaks. This was in a school I was just working in. Um, and so the teachers really struggled with what's the difference between a break and going to the try again chair. The break spot was outside the classroom. So is the try again chair different from the break chair or the break bean bag? So this is something that you have to figure out with the teachers, and I wouldn't say that there's any hard, fast rule, but it's just deciding what they want to do and then helping them to be consistent. In this particular school, we actually needed to talk about it on a school-wide level because taking a break was really a school-wide understood policy, so we, we needed to have all teachers being consistent about what the difference was. Um, another thing that often comes up is managing a timeout sequence and your classroom at the same time can be really difficult. Um, so for those of you not familiar with PCIT, the sequence involves the child going to the try again chair, staying there till they calm down, the teacher checking on them to see if they're ready to come back when they're calm, then coming back in and rectifying or being able to be successful with the situation or the behavior. Um, teachers find this very overwhelming when they're trying to manage a class. So um, getting them very, very comfortable with these skills, so it's almost like it's second nature and that's where the mastery um, criteria comes in and then how like, do they do that at all when the class needs to like still be run yeah dr avani asked how do they do that at all when the class needs to be run and um it, it is difficult i've seen teachers do it um they will so there's the, there's the rule in pcit that it's three minutes on the timeout chair exactly plus five seconds of quiet um teachers often will know okay i have have Alex outside on the try again chair. Let me get my kids working on an activity quickly or like engaged in something and then they'll prop the door open. Okay, you're sitting quietly. Are you ready? It's like it has to be done really quickly, but it is difficult. 
uh, and which is why this is often the hardest thing for them to implement. And No, they're often it, we have there might be interested in lots of kids. Um, if if they're at the point where they can't sit on that chair, um, sometimes the timeout room is used or a break room. Um, the other Im important thing that I actually didn't mention is in PCIT, when you're doing PDI, it's always the timeout chair. There is the consequence. Um, in TCIT, teachers all have options for consequences. So for example, if there's a crisis call that, like if there's a, a designated person to call for crisis, often if teachers know my students are not sitting out together, they would have to call Mr. Blah Blah to come get you. If that's a consequence. If that's a consequence. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and it, teachers have used it as a, as a consequence. Um, so yeah, part of it is like figuring out what is the right consequence to use. Um, I talk knowing when to scans. Okay. Um, so the other just point, these are lists, and then I'm going to have some time for some questions, um, is when, what happens enforcement has a seal on evoking desired behavior. So um, I'm thinking of a math class with about six kids and uh, where they, these kids just really loved aggravating each other, um, touching each other, talking to each other. and this teacher was seriously a pro at these skills and no amount of CDI or even um, TDI that she did was reinforcing or punishing enough to stop these kids from getting to interact with each other. So what's more reinforcing? So that that's where we start to using tangible reinforcement. So this teacher used goldfish um, <laughs> as a reinforcement and placed them on, on the kid's desk. Um, we also used other things like using the smart board, um, getting to use a whiteboard. Uh, these are more strategies that are usually more in the classroom already. Um, if there's classroom point systems, we'll help the teachers use them from the beginning. Um, and then sometimes using DRCs, so daily report cards, if you're targeting a specific that child's own tangible reinforcement that they know they're going to get. Uh, and like I said from the beginning, this has a um, little snapshot of looking into a study was so powerful that I wanted to show you. So this is one of the most um, like behaviorally challenged, challenging schools um, in the city. And, and, and you can see, I think Dr. Kirks was working on this um, intervention. Um, and they're in the year 08-09. They were looking at the number of times it, the crisis uh, disruptive that the child had to be removed. And in that 2000, in the second year of T, it was that of 6 to 430. Um, so that's just one variable or one uh, measure of the effectiveness. But uh, there's also a lot of other research out there that we would be happy to share with you guys um, if you have questions after the presentation. OK, and the last thing is, um, uh, like I said, TCAT has been adapted and tailored to different settings. Um, so something uh, Dr. Avney asked about earlier was co was competency and mastery criteria. Um, so the way that um, off traditionally the coding is done is in a pullout session. So the teacher actually had the opportunity to sit one on one with a child and use the CDI skills in a pullout. So then we hold them to the same mastery criteria because they're not teaching a lesson. Um, when they do the prevention and shaping, there's a completely different uh, list of mastery criteria. It's basically a list of um, five behaviors that the teacher has to get the child to be able to do without giving commands. Um, and then when in the TDI criteria, it's also the same, and the teacher is supposed to practice in a, in a pullout um, setting. So this can be difficult if you have a school, so that's kind of the second point, where you don't get to do as pullout, maybe no pullout or maybe less pullout. It's, there's coverage is sometimes a barrier, you know, resources. Um, it really depends on the setting. So I was recently working in a special ed setting where the teachers couldn't necessarily have pullout 
coaching sessions. So we adapted or we tailored the mastery criteria to competency criteria and kind of decided as a team how we would, would um, kind of quantify the teacher's progress. And it was different and they were allowed a higher level of they were allowed a higher level of academic questions, but still the same, less like behavioral based kind of questions. Um, and then some other things we'll tr try is trainer modeling, having additional role play sessions or settings where the teachers get to practice, like for example, the teacher directed skills when they're not in the classroom, so they get more practice. And um, at times doing like an entire staff training. So if you're in a setting where there's TAs and paras and several adults who are all working and having their hands on uh, working with different kids it can be hard when one teacher is trying to implement active ignoring and then the para jumps in and then reinforces the behavior so we can't coach all teachers but what we have tried is having several teachers have a bug in the ear at the same time so that they can all be hearing the coaching also just doing a staff training for the whole school so that at least people can be familiar with questions so i think the way this works is i will be looking at the chat room i can start off with a question okay great <clears throat> um <laughs> how often well i'm assuming that And if a school is doing TCIT, do you ever then um, get XEs from the kids' parents to see if anything is generalizing in the other direction? Good, good question. So the questions were um, if that if the CESPI is used, which it is, and how often you administer the CESPI, which is the somebody help me with the acronym, the student. Iber Iber Iberg, Iberg Behavioral Iberg. Checklist, right? Something like that. And then the ECB, which is the, it's basically the standardized, standardized measures that are used in PCAT to track decreases of disruptive behavior. Um, and if the ECB is given to parents to see if disruptive behavior goes down at home. Um, Sutter Iberg, thank you. Thanks for the help, Steve. Um, so. Um, yes, the SESB is given. So in some settings, um, the teachers are identifying at the beginning of the intervention, like one to three students in their classroom that they're targeting. And the teachers will be given the SESB at the beginning, like pre, um, usually at, at, um, at each entry into new phase, into each phase. So after phase one, phase two, and phase three, and then sometimes post um, months after. Uh, and I, I haven't personally, or it, in my experience, given ECBs to parents. I have had teachers end up referring families for PCIT after learning these skills. Um, but I think it would be definitely such great information in terms of generalization to home um, to give parents ECBs. Okay. So Steve's writing. He's chiming in. I don't know if you guys can see. Oh, he's saying, oh, he wants me to ask one more question for voting so that people can be eligible for our prize. Okay, um, I'll have to think. I'm gonna think of a question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pull my my live audience to help me think of a quest a quiz question. Should we do voting or which rule? Has to be yes, not agree, or disagree. Oh, yes. We could do a couple. We could do like a prize skill, skill. Uh, okay, we're gonna do we're gonna do three. So um, <laughs> yeah, we'll do three. Okay. Um, They can, they can, okay. They, yeah, that's. Agree, disagree. This is a good question to ask in the classroom and PCIT. Something's happening on here. Thank you for 
leaving with us. Okay. Um, In the meantime, Christy, yes. I have another question. Yes. Um, can a consequence, it sounds like the consequence um, that you described is either the chair or having someone to call. Um, can it be something like a loss of privilege? Yeah. In school? It, yeah, so the, like, so. you miss lunch. It, yeah, it can. So, so Dr. Abney was asking <clears throat> the consequence we consequences we stated were try again chair, like a crisis call, <clears throat> or like, and then she was saying, could it be a loss of privilege? Um, so the answer to that is definitely yes. Um, teachers are really at liberty to use any consequence that they think is going to be effective. Um, and then Dr. Avni said, like, losing lunch. So that would be a consequence. It might be a recess. consequence. Or recess, yeah. <laughs> Not lunch. So, so maybe, yeah, you can't take that free <laughs> But I would encourage teachers to make it, like, a, um, as an immediate consequence as possible. So if it was, like, the morning, first thing in the morning, I would maybe wouldn't say losing lunch, but something more immediate to happen. Um, but, yeah, I've had t teachers use, um, like, having to do an extra worksheet like a skills worksheet right away instead of working on the other activity. Um, losing the opportunity to participate in something fun at the end, like movement at the end of that period. Um, different different things. They find all, I've had teachers get really creative. Like um, one teacher made uh, an emo a laminated happy emoji face. And this child loved having the emoji face on her desk because it was a sign to her that she was doing well. So the teacher would actually say, if you can't keep a quiet voice, then I'll have to take your happy face away. And that was enough of a consequence for her I like that, to participate. That there's more flexibility. Um, yeah, there's more fle there has to be more flexibility um, because they're managing a classroom. OK, agree, disagree, question. Um, so. Um, Sammy is running around the class and um, screaming and then the teachers uh, just active ignoring and eventually Sammy walks to his seat and starts working and the teacher says, Sammy, great job. Is that a labeled praise? Yes. Agree or disagree? Send in your votes because you might get... A gift card to somewhere. I guess <laughs> that might be it. <laughs> Sammy, yes, says Steve, and the winner is. I'm reading his typing to me, everybody. If they voted. What? If they voted, they win. <laughs> <laughs> Give them more. Okay, I'm. Oh, he's wow. doing a random selection. That's so cool. Stephanie Biller, you are the winner. <laughs> Spect of reward. That's awesome. Starbucks Starbuck. gift card. That's what I thought. <laughs> so cool. So fun. Yeah, that's <laughs> I have Christy another question. Yes, we have another live question. Um so actually um, so when it's CCIT, it's just one child, um, and so the praise is coming from the parents, like in the, in the context that they're in, which usually does not involve a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of kids who have anxiety, um, and so I'm thinking for a lot of the kids that I know and see, if they were to be getting like giant labeled praises in class. Um, that would actually not be reinforcing for them and would would be um, very difficult for them and might make, actually then make their behavior worse. Yeah. So what do they do when they have anxious kids who really don't like to be like the center of attention? Yeah, I think that like just in the same, so uh, Dr. Avi's question was what, um, if because praising in a group is different than praising mm -hmm. in a dyad. And if you have students who have internalizing anxiety or social anxiety, a labeled praise in front of all the other students might actually um, increase undesired behavior. So um, that's where like the flexibility that you might not necessarily have in 
PCIT comes into TCIT and and that teacher might, um, you know, work out that they give a thumbs up or a pat on the back or a signal with that child that they're reinforcing them. And then ideally that child with social anxiety probably wouldn't be one of the three targeted kids that you're coding the teacher's skills with. So if you were coding the teacher's labeled praises, you wouldn't you wouldn't be coding them in a pullout session with that child. You'd but the expectation is that they're, they need to be skilled on the whole class. Yes. So when um, it's done, like it, it's it's done in pull out and push in. So there's some pull out sessions with targeted students. And then when you push in, you might not necessarily be coding the teacher skills in a push in. You're just helping them to use the skills. Yeah. Um, I didn't quite Another question. Said this, but is the type of praise flexible? So if a kid has social anxiety and you can use a emoji sticker on their desk as a praise instead of using a verbal praise and just walk by them and say, good job, you're doing X instead of announcing it in front of the class. Is that encouraged to, as a tailoring for that specific child who's anxious? It, yeah, that, so using like an emoji sticker, like that tangible showing of praise is still positive reinforcement. And if it helps in evoke the desired behavior, then it can be used. It just wouldn't be coded as a labeled praise for the teacher's skills. So. Steve is writing for me as a note to uh, talk about age range. So IT, TCIT is done with kid, kids ages two to seven. Um, we uh, clinically, and I'm not sure, uh, awesome TCIT trainers in the field. I've done it with fourth and fifth graders and third graders, and it's um, just it's been very effective. It wasn't a special ed setting where kids developmentally might not be at socially at a fifth grade level, but uh, it was extremely effective. And also in terms of the try again chair, um, if you have a large fifth grade boy or girl um, who's aggressive physically, you might that might not be a time to use the try again chair. That might be a different consequence. So, oh, and uh, Dr. Kurtz is correcting me that it, it's gone up to age 12 in the research. So there you go. Okay, one final question. We have one minute. Do you explain to the kids or do the teachers explain to the kids? Um, like why there's going to be now this random person in here who has a headset on and I'm going to start doing a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Avni asked, who explains to the kids why this stranger's in the classroom? And the, everything comes from the teacher. I am the mo the trainer keeps the most incognito, blank, non-affect presence as possible, active, ignoring the kids, and then they get used to it. But they do get an explanation. They do get an explanation, of course, because it's like, um, uh, Miss Miss Abney, why do you have that thing in your ear? What are you wearing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so of course. And what is the explanation? Um, like just how I'm learning to help you. Um, Miss Tadros is in here helping me and giving me some skills. That's it. Okay, Dr. K, it's all you. I'm turning my mic off now. Bye, everybody.